in my last lecture, I was discussing on the MEMS material properties that was not completed. So, today for some time I will discuss on the same topic that is MEMS materials properties and after that I will switch over on to, on to different subject that is microelectronics technology which is used for MEMS. So, let us now continue the last lecture which is MEMS material properties. So, today I will discuss on different properties which I discussed in last class. Those are piezoelectricity of piezoelectric property of the material. So, piezoelectricity is understood as a linear electro mechanical interaction between mechanical and the electrical state in crystal without a center of symmetry. Those crystals which does not have center of symmetry will show the piezoelectric property. So, basically if a in this figure you can see a piezoelectric material is here and if we apply the force in the surface of these two uh, of the uh, two surface of this particular material then you will find that at the surface of the material some charge will be accumulated and that phenomena is known as piezoelectric phenomena. That means, if we apply force or pressure the charge will be accumulated at the surface and there is a different uh, uh, here you can see in the bottom uh, if you apply stress that means, uh, as a result of stress the strain will be developed inside the material and as a result of which a realignment of the ions will be there and at the surface you will get positive and negative charges. So, this phenomena is very useful in case of microsensors and microactuators. There are two type of piezoelectric effect, one is known as direct piezoelectric effect and another is known as convert piezoelectric effect. The direct piezoelectric effect is used for microsensor and the converse piezoelectric effect is used for actuators, microactuators. So, direct piezoelectric effect basically if we apply certain external force or pressure on the surface of the crystal. So, some charge will accumulate at the surface as a result of which you will get some voltage if you if you uh, uh, connect the two surface with a wire you will get some voltage. So, that means, the is the electro mechanical if you apply the mechanical pressure you are getting some electric field that can be used as a micro sensor. On the other hand if you apply certain electric field at the surface of the crystal then the crystal inside the crystal there is a movement or strain will be developed that means, mechanical energy or mechanical force will generate. So, that property can be used for designing a micro actuator that means, piezoelectric material can be used either micro sensor then it is a direct piezoelectric effect or it can be used as a piezo uh, as an actuator when you are taking help of converse piezoelectric effect. So, this particular material uh, has got certain structure and these materials uh, structure always lacks a center of symmetry and they will show piezo this is not piezo resistive I am sorry it will be piezoelectric effect. Okay. The effect is characterized by charge sensitivity coefficient and which is known as d i j coulomb part Newton C by n. It relates uh, the amount of charge generated at the surface of the material which has got area A on the i axis to the applied force A on the j axis. So, if you apply force on the j axis then the i axis you will get some charge generated generation and that is basically d i j you will get. So, d equal to epsilon r into e this is a well known relation that is e is electric field is the displacement here epsilon r is the basically the permittivity. So, that is equal to epsilon naught e plus p and this delta q i which is the charge generation due to the applied mechanical force is equal is given by small d i j delta f j which is again written as d i j delta of sigma into a, a is the area. So, that equation is this is a charge generation equation and with that from this charge accumulation you can 
extract some voltage at the two surface. Here there is a material called ferroelectrics. The ferroelectrics material will have piezoelectric effect, but all piezoelectric materials are not ferroelectric material. So, converse is not true, but all ferroelectrics are piezoelectric. Okay. Now, here is a table and here uh, some of the properties are shown. The properties are whether uh, the crystal is single crystal or polymer or ceramic and their d i j value piezoelectric coefficient or piezoelectric constant which is the d i j here is i and j stands for different axis. For example, quartz which is, is a piezoelectric material and single crystal is a d 3 3 is equal to 2.33 and its relative permeability is 4.5. Similarly, P V D F is a polymer material, it has it is also it also shows piezoelectric property and the piezoelectric constant and coefficients in different axes are shown here. Similarly, barium titanate which is a ceramic material and this is a, a ceramic and it will have also piezoelectric property and its very high permittivity 1700 or 4100 in different axis direction one is 3 3. Uh, 3 1 and this 3 3. So, 3 3 direction permittivity is higher than the 3 1 direction. Another ceramic material which is PZD lead zirconate titanate is a very useful material for micro sensors that also shows piezoelectric property with these values the coefficients are 110 to 370 in 3 3 axis. Zinc oxide is another material which is a metal oxide and with a permittivity of 1400 and it will show the piezoelectric uh, co coefficient or constant is 246. And now, if you see here uh, the, this bottom table that means, stress sensitivity of different material. So, what is the effect on resistance if you apply certain mechanical pressure on particular body? E, what is the effect on piezo risk resistive effect? inductance change and capacitive and piezoelectric. Now, if you compare the values, then we have seen that those materials where stress sensitivity in case of piezoelectric material is highest. This value is 5 in comparison to other materials which is 0 0.005 the piezo capacitance effect, piezo inductive effect is 0 0.001, piezo resistance is 0 0.0001 and uh, only resistance is 0 0.00005. So, that means, compared to other other uh, property chain, we found that piezoelectric material uh, shows uh, the piezo sensitivity is almost 5, which is which is a very large value and this property may be fruitfully utilized, you can utilize it for making some piezo sensors or some other actuators also. Now, uh, the, what are the advantages of the piezoelectric sensors? There are manifold advantages and those advantages are namely, it is extremely high rigidity materials uh, are rigid materials, high natural frequency up to 500 kilohertz you can get with the piezoelectric materials if you make sensor. It is a high reproducibility, extremely wide measuring range very high stability that means, full scale is very wide you can get it extremely wide measuring range, very high stability, wide operating temperature range this is a very important property which you cannot get in case of piezo resistance sensor because piezo electric effect does not depend on the temperature that is why this kind of sensors you can use in wide temperature ranges. Insensitivity to electric magnetic fields and to radiation that is also very important property. And whenever you use any sensor lot of other other uh, electromagnetic fields are there. For example, lot of cosmic radiation, ioning radiation if you use that particular sensor in space will be there, you cannot get rid of that. Not only that electromagnetic fields will be there, electric and magnetic field even if you in a laboratory there are certain amount of uh, the magnetic or electric field may be available due to some. Uh, the line voltage or due to some high voltage equipment or due to presence of very heavy magnet in the laboratory, you cannot get rid of that. So, you want your sensor should not be disturbed with those uh, the with those extra extra radiation or extra field. So, in that respect 
the piezoelectric materials is one good choice because this property or this effect does not depend on the radiation, it does not depend, uh, uh, does not change with respect to the magnetic and extra electric field. Okay. Now, uh, the another property we will discuss that is thermo resistivity. Thermo resistivity is known, you know the different paper material will have temperature coefficient of resistance that is thermo resistivity. That means, if you change the temperature, the resistance will change that property is known as thermo resistivity. Resistance changes with changing temperature and the, the, the well known radiation is a here R equal to rho into L by A, rho is the resistivity, L is the length of a bar and A is the area, the area is equal to W into T and T is the thickness of that bar and W is the width. So, now rho equal to L divided by W into T where A equal to W into T and sigma which is nothing but reciprocal of the resistivity, sigma is the conductivity is given by Q mu n n plus mu p p, these are well known relation, preliminary relations. And the, this thermo resistivity basically change of resistance with temperature that relation is given by R t is equal to R naught into 1 plus alpha r into T minus T naught, where the alpha r is a temperature coefficient of resistance. This alpha r value is different for different material and because of that alpha r change you will get you will get different thermo resistive property of different material. And here is a table which shows the resistivity as well as temperature coefficient of resistance which is the alpha r. Alpha r and resistivity is, is compared for different material. For example, carbon, magnesium, nichrome, chromium, aluminum, silver, copper, platinum, tungsten, iron, nickel and gold. These materials are frequently used in many microsensor MEMS or in case of VLSI also. So, there if you look into the table, then you will find that uh, the gold will have the highest T c which is 8300 ppm per degree centigrade, but this particular material you cannot use, use uh, 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 because of certain reason and one of the reason I mentioned earlier, gold alone you cannot make the film with good adhesion and uh, although it is a noble metal, but the problem is that the thin film uh, does not adhere properly with gold and you have to take help of some other uh, the adherent uh, uh, other uh, thin film material for proper addition with the uh, substrate. So, so gold uh, very rarely used for T c sensitive sensor or where thermo uh, resistivity effect is used. Rather one material is used frequently which is nickel and which is having 6900 ppm per degree centigrade is alpha and this is also very high. The for uh, many cases for example, uh, the flow sensor where the uh, thermoelectric uh, where these uh, alpha r or temperature coefficient of resistance effect uh, property is utilized. So, there we use nickel as a sensing material because of very high uh, temperature coefficient of resistance value. Okay. And with that nickel as a sensing material, the ohmic contact you can use for chromium gold, it does not matter, but nickel is a is a good choice for uh, sensor where you want to utilize the property of thermo resistivity. Okay. Now, another property I would like to discuss is pyroelectricity. Pyroelectricity effect is basically development of electric polarization due to temperature change. Okay. Temperature change, that means if you change the temperature of that particular body, you can or crystal or material, the electric polarization dipole realignment will be done inside the crystal as a re result of which you will have certain charge at the surface which is the pyroelectric effect. Thermoelectric is a temperature change, your resistance is changing that is the thermo uh, electricity which is earlier I mentioned. Another is a pyroelectricity is again there we are changing the resistance, but here we are getting some electric field charge you get at the surface. So, both are dependent on the temperature. So, the pyroelectricity effect is utilized in many cases of the temperature or radiation sensor, IR radiation sensor or many other 
high temperature measurement sometimes pyroelectric materials are used and it occurs in non centrosymmetric crystals. This pyroelectric effect is observed in case of non centrosymmetric crystal. Again all pyroelectric materials are also piezoelectric not vice versa because pyroelectric is a subset of the piezoelectric material. So, pyroelectric city you can all pyroelectric materials basically shows the pyro uh, piezoelectric effect. Okay. So, that means uh, all piezoelectric will not may not show the, uh, the pyroelectric, but all pyroelectric will show the piezoelectric effect. Now, the p sigma is equal to the relation is delta p uh, sorry sigma p by sigma t, where p stands for the polarization and t is the temperature change. So, materials in the pyroelectricity uh, we, materials which shows the pyroelectric effect are zinc oxide and PZD and lead titanate. PZD is a lead zirconium titanate and the lead titanate P, uh, PBTI O3. So, here you see among three materials, these two material PZD and lead titanate is having some lead co composition, but zinc oxide does not have. So, lead material normally is not used in case of uh, the VLSI uh, process line because you know uh, lead at a single material is not is not an user friendly material it is some kind of hazard hazard chemical. So, that is why nowadays zinc oxide material is used frequently for either piezoelectric material or pyroelectric material rather than PZD and lead titanate. Earlier PZD and lead titanate were used for making sensor where the MEMS technology is not used and where the peripheral integrated circuit is not connected. So, then individually you can process it, you cannot you may not bring those material into clean room environment. So, it is no problem, but if you go for MEMS technique or MEMS method for making the sensor, then uh, obviously, you have to choose certain material which is user friendly to the VLSI process and you can because you should not contaminate the whole uh, the process equipments or the process uh, gadgets means uh, accessories by lead contamination. Okay. So, that is why out of the three material zinc oxide is much popular and lot of work is going on on zinc oxide. So, next uh, uh, is a another property is a black body radiation. So, black body radiation you know black body uh, is an uh, always any sort of uh, property on radiation is compared is compared with respect to the black body. So, black body is a, a radiation the equation is given by Planck's equation and what is the Planck's equation? Planck's equation is a relation between the radiant flux and the emissivity at a particular temperature. So, radiation radiant flux is basically the spectral flux density and denoted by W lambda and emitted by a black body of emissivity emissivity epsilon at temperature T is given by the Planck's equation which is given here W lambda is equal to epsilon lambda twice pi h c square where h is Planck's constant and c is the velocity of light. So, the epsilon which is a emissivity is a degree to which it is basically defined as a degree to which a body emits less efficiently than a black body. Degree to which a body emits less, less efficiently than a black body is the emissivity definition and for a black body E equal to 1. And another important equation which is used in case of radiation uh, physics that is the Wien's displacement, Wien's or Wien's displacement law which is lambda p q 2 8 9 8 divided by t, t is the temperature in absolute in micrometer. That means, uh, the all body which is which is heated it emits certain radiation and wavelength of that radiation is given by this relation. Okay. And another equation is very important which is Stephens Boltzmann's equation and that also at a if you heat a body with a temperature t, it emits certain radiation and that radiation flux emitted from that body is a W t is given by epsilon sigma t to the power 4. 
is the temperature and epsilon and sigma and uh, the sigma is the stephen boltzmann constant and epsilon is the permittivity so these are the uh, relations used in case of black body radiation and here is a plot radiation flux versus wavelength for epsilon equal to 1 and t equal to room temperature 300 kelvin so here uh, this particular nearly 10 micron the radiation peak is maximum and in this particular plot or particular body if you get it so total power is calculated from the area of the curve so that is a normal uh, the power uh, available from a particular body is calculated in this technique and the radiation flux at different wavelengths because different body at different temperature emits different wavelength which is given by this equation which is the displacement dispenser law. Now, this is a radiation pyrometer one uh, uh, sensor or one device which is used for measuring very high temperature because at low temperature we use thermocouple kind of sensor, but if you want to measure the temperature of uh, in the range of 1500 or 2000 degree centigrade for example, you want to measure the temperature of blast furnace in metallurgical industry. So, their temperature is in the range of 800 or 1200, 800 to say 2000 degree centigrade and that temperature is very difficult to measure using the conventional, conventional uh, the thermo, uh, thermo, uh, thermoelectric effect that sensor if you use it thermocouple sensor you cannot get it because at that temperature the materials will, will soft and melt if you use thermocouple but there are one technique you can use radiation pyrometer. So, radiation pyrometer basically uh, uh, uses the laws, this laws basic, basically Stephen's law or uh, the Vince displacement law. So, the radiation in that body if you absorb it, so its wavelength it emits and that from that wavelength you can calculate the temperature. Okay. So, that is one of the application of the, the radiation sensors. So, now, now comes to the optical properties. I told you that uh, the, uh, the there is a class of MEMS which is known as a MOEMS micro opto electrical or opto um, micro opto electromechanical system that is MOEMS. So, this MOEM use the optical properties of the material. So, we have to know little bit about the optical properties also. So, this particular uh, table shows the electromagnetic spectrum basically uh, the uh, visible spectrum is okay, you can see the radiation from red to violet, the temperature uh, the wavelength ranges are say 300, uh, 390 nano uh, mic micrometer to here say uh, red is a 0 0.770 micrometer. So, in between you will get blue, green, yellow, orange, this is the visible range and other than the visible range, the ultraviolet and infrareds are frequently used in many sensors and ultraviolet range is 0 0.390 to 0 0.01 micrometer. On the other hand, infrared, near infrared, medium infrared, far infrared and extreme infrared, they have separated different spectrum region and it extends from 0 0.77 micrometer to 1000 micrometer which is extreme infrared region. Now, so in, the, in between these infrared and ultraviolet there are certain uh, wavelength ranges or frequency spectrum frequency ranges in the left side wavelength is the right side. So, for example, radio waves long electrical oscillation infrared or ultraviolet x ray gamma ray cosmic ray in this range. So, this is the complete spectrum is given in this particular diagram in this chart. So, different sensor operates in different spectrum uh, spectral uh, location and accordingly the property of the sensor will also change. Now, the there are two kind of opto optical effect in case of uh, materials which is used in case of sensor. One is the photovoltaic effect, other is the photoelectric effect. Both effect basically is based on the photon. Photon is incident on that particular body, you will get photovoltaic or photoelectric. What is the difference between these two? is mentioned here. On absorption of the photons that means optical energy when the there is a transition from valency to the conduction band that effect is known as photovoltaic effect. 
On the other hand, on absorption of the photo energy, if the transition of the of the carrier is from conduction band to vacuum, so it is known as photoelectric effect. So, both effects are used in making sensor. So, obviously, in if you use semiconductor material, then the energy of the photon will be such that such that the electron uh, uh, can can have a transition from valency band to the conduction band. That means, the photon energy is given by H nu. So, H nu must be greater than E g, E g is the band gap. So, if that energy is less than E g, so that will not show any of this optical effect or it will not change the properties, then it is it emits through the crystal and it is those uh, things are known as optical windows basically. So, there is no transition, but if H nu is greater than E g, so there will be a transition, there is a possibility some of the carriers will jump from valency band to conduction band of the carriers may go from conduction band to the vacuum level as a result of which you will if the movements of carriers are there you will get some current and that is known as the photo current. Okay. Now, its energy E is equal to H nu and is given by H c by lambda and for far infrared this is a 10 to the power 11 hertz is the new frequency and for far ultraviolet is a 10 to the 17 hertz. There is a law which is known as the Beer's law. It is it relates to the absorption of the radiation of different material. So, this absorption is a function of depth. So, if photon is incident on a body, so this photon is absorbed, first it has to absorb, then other effects will show one by one. So, this absorption is again is a function of depth. So, some of the radiation it depends on the energy, so it goes higher depth and it is absorbed there and some of the radiation cannot penetrate is a higher depth. And that Beer's law states that absorption A is equal to A naught e to the power minus alpha into x, where this alpha is known as the absorption coefficient and x is the depth. And A naught is obviously is x equal to 0, so A equal to A naught. So, at the surface the absorption is A naught and, and, and then if you go higher and higher depth, obviously the A value will reduce. That is the Beer's law. Now, the optical properties in semiconductor if you discuss, so you have to have uh, you have to discuss on on direct band semiconductor and indirect band semiconductor. So, which has got much more optical effect. So, if you concentrate on the direct band semiconductor which is gallium arsenide or C 5 semiconductor or 2 4 semiconductors are there, that means you are minimum of the conduction band and the maximum of the valence band on the same wave number, it align on the same wave number. So, uh, in, in a momentum axis. So, there the, the transition from the valence band the conduction band is direct, direct there is no loss of energy in between. So, that is basically the direct band semiconductor, the no phonon is necessary for electron transfer. Phonon is basically the lattice vibration that energy is a phonon is a that and, and photon is the optical radiation energy the photon. Now, no phonon necessary directly from valency to conduction band it it, it transfer and as a result of which the you can have some radiation from there which uh, whose color depends on the H uh, E g value which is uh, calculated from E g equal to H nu from that relation. Now, on the other hand indirect band gap semiconductor examples are silicon and germanium there uh, you see direct transition is not possible. So, now it, uh, here the minimum of the conduction band and the maximum of the valency band does not lie on the same wave number. So, in the different wave number, so as a result of which there will not be a direct transition. So, first from the valency band top it will go here and from there again that means, there is a collision here in between and from there it is transferred in the conduction band. So, here probability of going the carrier from valency band to conduction band is less because the uh, semiconductors are indirect band gap. So, it will goes through via some lattice collision. So, here the phonons are required. So, probability of using optical device decreases as it is a two particle process because from here you require another particle here. So, from there after the, uh, the collision or say scattering from here 
it goes to the conduction band. So, that is why this class of semiconductors are not normally used in optical devices, whether this the direct beam semiconductors are much popular in case of optical devices. Now, some of the optical properties are also mentioned in this table. Band gap at room temperature means 300 Kelvin and band gap at 0 Kelvin are shown here in electron volt and the lambda max at that means radiation from that particular material of wavelength at room temperature is shown in this particular column. So, materials starting from boron nitride, carbon, zinc sulphide, gallium nitride, zinc oxide, silicon carbide, cadmium sulphide, gallium phosphide and so on lot of C 5 materials and 2 6 materials are shown this band gap along with the radiation you will get from that particular material. You will find some of the materials you will get if the this wavelength is a beyond 0 0.8 micron or 0 0.9 micron 0 0.9 micron then only you get some radiation which is in the visible region. Otherwise, if you use uh, too low so that will be in the infrared region which you cannot see. Okay. So, for uh, uh, visibility sometimes we use uh, the material whose band gap lies in the range of 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 the uh, micrometer. Okay. So, now uh, the other method is the electro optic sensing and that uh, is uh, by applying the electric field. So, optical uh, uh, by radiation or optical energy energy some electric uh, energy is evolved. For example, say photo detectors is one example. So, there if you apply certain uh, optical energies incident on that particular device which is a basically PN junction device diode, then because of the absorption of the photon energy some carriers will be generated and those carriers if you bias that particular junction they will uh, transfer from one region to other region they will cross the junction as a result of which you will get some photo current and that is one kind of sensor which is highly sensitive to radiation. Okay. So, this kind of sensor depends basically or how much carriers will be generated, how many carriers of the generated after absorption of the photon. So, then obviously, it depends on how much photon energy is absorbed. Okay. So, after absorption then only photo generation, so generation will be there. So, now here one parameter is a is known as a G, D is a the optical carrier generation rate. So, that G parameter is important at the same time after generation. So, the lifetime of the carrier is a tau value. So, this optically generated carrier is G and tau is a tau n is the electron electron lifetime and tau p is the whole lifetime. So, then the the conductivity because of the absorption of the radiation is given by increase of the conductivity that is a delta sigma is equal to q into mu n g tau n plus mu p g tau p. This relation is directly related with optical absorption generate generation of the carrier and lifetime of the carrier. But without in absence of the in absence of this photon absorption the equation is sigma equal to q into mu n n plus mu p mu is well known and this relation is also well known. Here the how it uh, how the carrier generation takes place is shown one parameter is E p the energy of the photon must be greater than E g. So, then this is the intrinsic semiconductor this is the extrinsic semiconductor and this is the photo junction three cases it is shown how the carriers are generated. So, here after absorption if the E p is greater than E g then the it will absorb the energy then obviously, after absorption the some of the electrons will jump from the valency band to conduction band as a result of which some holes will be created which is known as the EHP electron hole pair. Similarly, in extrinsic semiconductor donor atoms will be there you know in case of the hole uh, in case of p type semiconductors the don uh, the acceptor atoms level will be very close to the valency band E v that is the E a acceptor atom level. Similarly, in case of the n type semiconductors there is a energy level which is donor energy level very close to the E c just below few electron volt below that. And now in case of this extrinsic semiconductor 
the carriers will generate not only intrinsic means bulk that means below valence level, but also in the the E A level or E D level, acceptor level and donor level that means impurity level, both from the impurity level and from the bulk semiconductor which is available in case of intrinsic semiconductor both will be generated and as a result of which here you will get much more the uh, carriers available uh, due to absorption of the radiation or optical energy or photon absorption. Now, in the in this particular picture it shows how the uh, current is uh, obtained. So, you see in uh, if this is a junction and if you properly bias the junction the photo generated carrier. So, which is a the hole here and electron here the hole can go up the hill you know and the electron can push down the hill. So, as a result of which when this will be generated it will there will be a tendency that particular electron always flow down the hill and it will cross the junction uh, and on the other hand hole which is generated here that will go up the hill. So, it will go in across the valency band in the other side of the junction. So, as a, a result of which electron and hole will cross the junction and you will get the photo current that is the photo junction. So, these are the properties which are utilized in in making various kinds of sensors and actuators. So, with this uh, just uh, I, I finish this particular uh, chapter which, which is basically based on the properties uh, material properties and those material properties used for making micro sensors and MEMS. Now, I will switch over to the next chapter. So, that is the, the microelectronic technology for MEMS. So, that is a that is a very important chapter. Till now we discussed regarding the different materials, their properties, various applications. Now, how the sensors are are fabricated in the lab. So, here in case of MEMS, we utilize the some of the process which is being used for long time for making the integrated circuit. Those properties or those particular process steps first I will discuss and then I will concentrate on the steps which are only required for MEMS fabrication. Okay. So, now this particular chart will show you the IC or MEMS fabrication cycle. So, it starts from here is the design thing and bottom uh, the cycle is the fabrication cycle. So, first uh, you have to design a particular MEMS device and what are the steps? First you, you make the solid models of the device and that solid model means you, you are going to use a certain material maybe that is crystalline material or that may be amorphous or some other material ceramic materials also may be. So, that material you first model it and free from the geometry that means that particular material may not be at regular geometry or regular shape, it may be irregular shape. So, irregular shape body or material simulation is little bit difficult and only the numerical only you have to use the numerical tool is the only technique by which you can the simulate any kind of the irregular shape or uh, uh, free shape body. So, that modeling is to be done first. Then I have to couple many other properties because in MEMS involves the electrical, mechanical, fluidic properties also. So, then you have to use certain simulation simulators and using that simulator you couple the electrical, mechanical, fluidic and kinematic properties also you include there. Then the with that this 3D solid model basically the finite element model you have to mesh it and you have to define the size of the mesh then you couple this properties with that particular solid body, then you simulate it and when you are satisfied with the simulation result, the next is the making of the layout. After making the layout of the devices, MEMS devices, then you have to go for mask making and that is generation of physical mask or direct write pattern. So, direct write pattern you sometimes use it for making the master mask and then we get the step and repeat camera and using that we get the regular mask 
which is used for fabrication. Now once the mask is fabricated, then design part is over. Then you come to the fabrication fab lab and there it starts from the crystal. So it's it basically first step you have to have the material that material in case of the silicon the uh, single crystal silicon is used. So I will show you uh, maybe one two slide in a, after that how the single crystal silicon is grown and polished. And then here in case of MEMS technology the mainly we require the deposition of material, patterning of the material and removal of the material. So this process this cycle continues. So here on the wafer you deposit certain material. So this is the blank wafer you deposited certain material on the wafer. Then you have to transfer certain pattern that is known as the pattern transfer and that is known lithography all of you know. So using the lithography technique the pattern is transferred and you can see here this is the film here on, on the wafer and here some pattern has been transferred. And after transferring the pattern on the wafer then selectively you have to remove some of the materials removal of selective removal of the materials and that is basically the etching or machining. So etching and machining if you do it then the wafer looks like this. So this cycle may continue. So maybe once, twice, thrice, so repeatedly depending on how complex is your process. So how complex is your device structure depending on that this cycle will continue and after that we will come up with the OFR having different kinds of structure and different uh, kind of sensing or pick up electronic circuit on the structure. Okay. So then next job is the probe testing. After using, after using the probar machine, you have to test before bonding testing is done by using a, with the help of certain probes. So probe testing is being done and whenever you are satisfied with the probe testing, then you have to do the sectioning. Sectioning means small pieces you are getting from the whole wafer and then is the individual die individual die is put on the, uh, the package base. So from the package base you take the connection that is the wiring from the bond pads to the external lid. So that connection is that is known as assembly into the package and after the bonding is over then you have to seal the package. Package sealing is being done after sealing then you have to go for a final test. So here you are doing one test which is known as the probe test and here is the final test. So number of devices which you are getting here which shows the correct result that number may reduce here because of the intermediate structural process step. But here some special points is to be mentioned here because from here to here in case of IC packaging and testing the the uh, the loss is less, but in case of MEMS devices damage is more because here you are going to use very thin membrane or thin cantilever thin structure. So special probing, sectioning and handling procedures is to be adopted to protect a released part. Okay. So some of the, uh, the, uh, the structure probe mass is, is hanged with the help of a cantilever. So if you go for conventional probing and conventional packaging which is used for VLSI packaging, so that will not serve your purpose. So you have to go for special techniques, you have to adopt for special techniques, otherwise the lot of the structures will be released that means which are hanging in case of MEMS uh, devices, they may break and you can spoil the devices. So other, the seal some part, another, another distinction from the normal VLSI thing is that you have to seal some selective part. So in case of VLSI, the complete part is sealed and packaged and the external leads you can connect by using some external wire or in PCB board you can put it. But in VLSI, uh, in MEMS packaging, so some portion you are covering and some portion you should not cover because that will be in touch with the external world, physical world. For example, in case of gas sensor, the sensing element must expose to the environment that you cannot keep it inside the package. Okay. 
similar things is not there in case of the VLSI, the whole complete thing you can seal and, and seal it. So, in, in MEMS some portion which require the interaction with the environment has to be kept outside the seal, sealed portion. So, that is the difference in the normal VLSI package and the MEMS package. So, then you have to final test and something uh, in the test if it qualify, then only you can you can uh, go for uh, the marketing. Okay. Now, the, the, uh, this particular slide shows the conventional methods, conventional process or steps taken from the VLSI technology steps. Those are crystal growth, thin film deposition process, pattern test of lithography, etching of materials, doping semiconductor, metallization, bonding and packaging. So, all these VLSI steps are also used in 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 uh, uh, in MEMS. So, this has been taken from normal IC technology steps. So, first let one by one we will discuss, first let me discuss on crystal growth. So, crystal growth basically silicon wafer fabrication, you can see here you know the technique is known as Jochalski technique. So, here silicon is melt and here is uh, the quartz crucible and these are the heaters. So, it has melted nearly 1400 degree centigrade, there is a seed crystal, then there, this is a seed crystal, then you pull the crystal, uh, just you rotate it and pull upward, so automatically from the seed the crystal will form. And the orientation of the crystal, what is is 1 0 0 or 1 1 1 and 1 1 0, all things depends on the seed crystal. If you take 1 0 0 seed crystal, the crystal will form according to that orientation. So, after pulling that means, very slow pulling and rotating and rotation is been given. So, uh, is, is, is given so that you can get uniform diameter the, the ingot that thing is known as ingot. So, this bottom figure just after pulling you got the, the ingot and if you cool it. So, this is this side cooling is also very very important. So, when you are cooling the melt, so automatically the impurity which are lot of impurities may be there in the melt which is not desired, those impurity atoms and uh, this is by segregation it will come into the hotter zone from the cold zone. As a result of which if you, if you slowly cool down, so from the cool zone it comes to the hotter zone and at the end, the end, end of the process those particular end uh, few slices you can reject it, so that the other portion will be pure, you will get the pure crystal. So, after getting that your next, this is the, uh, the industrial house where a lot of uh, the, uh, the crystal pullers are there. So, after getting the ingots, next your steps will be to make slices. So, these are uh, the instrument which are used for slicing, the ingot is placed here. So, this is a, the diamond uh, cutter is there. So, you see by uh, it is slicing the ingot is made into thin slices, after making thin slices it is basically transported here, so which is basically the polishing machine. So, there using certain uh, the, uh, the fine grit powders and maybe some fine green carbon particles also is, is used uh, for polishing along with some fluid and uh, just uh, using 3, 4 wafers and with certain rotation as given using certain uh, carbon, carbon endum one is powder, small particle carbon, uh, uh, the diamond particles is another helping a, uh, the cleaning or polishing material, you can use those to get the uh, polished single crystal silicon. After getting the wafer, so then you can process the wafer. So, next step is thin film deposition. So, thin film deposition one technique is known as the spin casting technique. So, spin casting technique which is used earlier, although the, this particular technique will not give you very good quality of the crystal, even then, so this is used in some cases where normal the deposition facility is not available. So, here you see through the nozzle you just eject some of the liquids here and then this particular uh, chuck is rotated at a high speed, so that using the centrifugal force it will spread over the 
over the uh, the solvent will spread and at the same time the the uh, what are the in in that particular phase what are the solvent that will evaporate the total mixture will spread and solvent will evaporate and as a result of which at the end you will get the film casted film on the this is some sort of spinner arrangement which is used for thick film sorry uh, photoresist uh, coating similar kind of things is used here so here one thing is the material must be in a liquid form otherwise you cannot spread over the entire slide so now this particular thing has certain problem and this type of film have a high stress value it will have less dense and more susceptible to chemical attack why the reason is that when you are spreading the film over the over the uh, the chuck by rotating chuck you are putting the putting the uh, liquid and then at the same time evaporation takes place during the evaporation of the solvents so it leaves some pores because of those pores the film will not be highly dense and at the same time when you subsequently use those films so through the pores some other gases may enter and that is that is why it is susceptible to chemical attack because of it is a less dense okay so that is why uh, this particular technique is not that much popular technique although is used in some typical cases and here is uh, the actual system the spin coating system is shown in the diagram okay now uh, uh, this is uh, one technique and other technique is the evaporation technique that technique i will discuss in the next lecture thank you I will continue with my previous talk that is uh, the microelectron technology for MEMS. Uh, here we have started discussion on the deposition of the thin film material. So, one of the technique is a spin casting technique that already I have discussed and now I will discuss some other technique by which you can get thin film that is evaporation technique. So, this particular technique use some evaporator and the basic principle is mentioned here we load certain wafer into a high vacuum chamber which is commonly pumped with either diffusion pump or a cryo pump so now why we need this vacuum chamber because vacuum chamber is required to reduce the contamination from the environment at the same time if you evaporate any material in vacuum its melting point and evaporation temperature will be less. So, these are the two reasons why we need vacuum for evaporation of certain material. So, now if you use vacuum chamber, so you have to use certain vacuum pumps and those pumps are two kinds, one is oil pump, other is oil free pump. So, in earlier days, we used to depend only on oil pumps that is rotary pump or diffusion pump or turbo molecular pump. But nowadays a separate class of pumps are available which you can use and there is there will not be any contamination from the oil you know oil is a source of hydrocarbon contamination. So now if you use pumps which use oil so there is a chance of some contamination of hydrocarbon into the vacuum chamber or into the film. So, nowadays all most of the uh, most of the vacuum chambers in VLSI laboratory they use oil free pumps they are namely the cryo pumps or the molecular iron pump or the sublimation pump. The cryo pump they use liquid cryogenic material basically liquid nitrogen which basically condense most of the gas molecules which can condense temperature near temperature of the liquid nitrogen 
So, those will be condensed and that will be absorbed by certain material. So, automatically vacuum will be created. So, you know in a in a atmosphere the major portion is nitrogen. So, if you can liquefy nitrogen and oxygen will liquefy before nitrogen. So, if these two constituents are liquefied then automatically the, the in, 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 in atmosphere most of the gases are 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 gone. So, pressure will go down. So, that is the basic principle by cryo pump. So, this is the reaction step. First SiH 4 at high temperature decomposes into SiH 2, then SiH 2 gas to amorphous, then from amorphous SiH 2 to silicon solid and hydrogen gas. Okay. So, after absorption then the solid material is coming out and it is deposited. Deposition reaction occurs at the surface of the wafer. So, now th there is another uh, the CBD technique which is known as LP CBD, low pressure chemical vapor deposition. So, to achieve reasonable deposition uniformity, the process is designed to keep the reaction strictly controlled by deposition kinetics. So, in this way in the chamber you can stack the wafer, this is the heating element, this is the furnace tube, the gas inlet you are ejecting, gas means some reactant gases are coming up, this is one reaction chamber and one of the advantage of this LPCVD is to prohibit the formation of nucleus. So, if you do the, the complete uh, reaction inside a chamber which is at a low pressure, the nucleation of the particle will not be there. If the chamber pressure is high, the nucleation will be there. What is the nucleation? Silicon, silicon, two, three molecule together form a nucleus and that partic particular particle will deposit onto the wafer. That means, that is a defect. We need if you go for single crystal silicon, we need a ordered growth molecule by molecule just like building a house by using brick. But instead of that, if the silicon particles are conglomerated and two, three particles together form a partic particulate and that particulate means that is a nucleation and that nucleation stops. So, if one defect is formed, that defect will continue throughout the crystal and that crystal you cannot use. If you use it at a low pressure CVD, so formation of the nucleation of the particles can be prohibited, can be prevented. Okay. So, this is the low pressure CVD uh, 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 the uh, technique and it is it is much more better than the atmospheric pressure CVD. Okay. Let me stop here today. So, next class we will continue with the uh, same topic that is microelectronic technology for membranes. Thank you very much.